This is Becky Labrat, founder of Lotus Launch, and I'm excited to share this special interview with you from one of my team members in real estate, Josh Pono. And um, some people might ask, what does real estate have to do with Lotus Launch? Well, some of you may know that I am also a real estate agent and I work really hard to continue to bring in income for my family and I while I'm um, working on launching Lotus. Um, a lot of us founders who work to build a business also have to do our regular jobs on the side and that continues until our business becomes profitable. So I've been doing a lot of side jobs in the last couple years, working as a research assistant at University of San Diego, um, working as a professor of real estate at Pacific States University, and Josh, who was my team member in La Jolla, Keller Williams, is now a team member for the Altman Brothers. And so he uh, invited him to talk to the class and share his journey about real estate and him as a business owner as well. He's on his own separate journey. So I hope you enjoy the interview and I hope you also take some nuggets from it. Um, not only in the market, but how you can find different ways to launch a business and work and make money on the side. Um, because it's not an either or, a lot of times it's a both. Enjoy. I am so excited that you're here. Hey, Josh. I mean, too. It's going to be fun. Yeah. It's going to be, I, it's going to be fun. Yes. So these are, these are my students. They may or may not come off of screen, but if you guys can come off of the screen, please do and turn on your videos. So Mr. Josh Pono can see your wonderful studious faces. I, <laughs> I've been working with Josh for, oh, two years ish. Gosh. Um, About and that. yeah, yeah. In the height of the pandemic, it was, uh, a lot of, he was basically my mentor and teacher during the time that we were going through the pandemic. And um, I always call him my big brother, even though I'm older than him, I have to like, remember that, <laughs> but it's, it's been such a pleasure working with Josh and learning from him. And, and, um, since we were both on the same team, we're on Brian Kane's real estate team, which is a high performing team in La Jolla, a part of Keller Williams. Um, we did these sales calls together every morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, from nine to 9.30 and talk through all the difficult transactions that we were going through with clients. Um, and just questions we had about, you know, what was going on during the pandemic and just how to help, um, you know, get over some buyer reluctance um, in the market. So it's, it's been just a journey. Um, both Josh and I moved to separate teams. So um, Josh is part of the Altman Brothers team, which I was telling you guys about, and I'm happy to pull up that. Um, I'm going to pull up that uh, website for you guys to take a look at here. And I'm going to put it in the chat as well, but I want to kind of just turn it back to Josh to do an introduction for him to do an introduction for himself. Um, and I have several questions that I want to ask and I'm pulling them up right now so that we can kind of go through this and um, going to give you guys just one second. We have some logistics things that we're getting through here, I'm sending you guys in the chat. The, um, the Altman Brothers website for you guys to go in, into. And I'm, I'm just super excited to have Josh just be a part of this and to share with you guys a little bit about his journey. We're going to do this in a little bit of a Q&A style. So first thing I want to do is jump in. Josh, tell me about you. Tell me about you. <laughs> okay. Give me the you know, like, what? give me the elevator pitch on Josh Pono, the, 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 the Josh Pono. Hey, -oh. uh, so thank you for having me here. And, uh, it's, uh, it's cool to, to talk to you guys. I hope you guys get a ton of value out of this. And, uh, for me, I I've been in real estate for about 12 years and, uh, the first eight years were doing uh, websites and lead generation and marketing for agents and um, and focusing on just learning the ins and outs of how to build a business in real estate and how to generate clients and how to 
uh, scale and operate uh, with other real estate businesses. And um, the plan was to uh, develop a skill set, a knowledge, and an experience that would prepare me for uh, not just getting into real estate and showing a couple homes, but building out a business that could allow me to create a vehicle to accomplish my goals. And um, my focus is to help other people get what they want in whether it's in life or business or real estate um, and taking on that servant's mentality, um, which has allowed me to accomplish a lot of my goals as well. Mm -hmm. And so what's your real estate superpower? Uh, you know, it's funny because a lot of people will ask me uh, about, you know, things that have helped me become successful. And um, most people uh, talk about like, they, they, I hear the word gift of gab a lot, or, you know, you're a natural speaker, uh, but it really comes down to listening. Mm -hmm. um, what, what a lot of people think about salespeople is that they're really good at convincing people what to do or what to buy or influence them. But what I've learned is that uh, if I want to influence somebody in the most effective manner, or if I need something to happen before I can get into the solution, I really have to understand the challenge and whether it's helping somebody buy real estate, whether it's somebody having an emotional little meltdown in the middle of yep. the escrow process, whether it's a, a listing agent who you know has 10 offers and I've got to get them to accept mine. Um, whether it's, you know, identifying which buyer is going to be the best for the seller, it all comes down to listening to what they're saying and what the nonverbal cues are and, mm -hmm. um, finding, finding really good clarity around what's really going on, right? Because there's surface level objection, like there's, there's knee jerk reactions, you know, why are you upset? I'm upset because that person didn't deliver my coffee fast enough. Usually it's, it's two or three layers down that something else is really bugging somebody and something else is the driving or motivating factor. And this just happens to be a symptom of what's really going wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so learning how to uh, listen with the intent to truly understand yes. and mm -hmm. then be understood. Seeking so, to understand. Um, I remember you saying it a lot during our powwows in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it's something that, that I constantly, I mean, and I didn't, I didn't create that obviously, right? Like that's been around for a really, really long right. time, but it was something mm -hmm. that I, I, str I struggled with it as a kid. I would, you know, rush to action or I would try to solve a problem before I had all the details. And, and what I learned is that, uh, it used to frustrate the hell out of me. It, it would really upset me because I had, would have pure intentions and wanting to move something forward and wanting to do something great and everything would unravel and fall apart in my hands and make, and really, really frustrate me. Um, and every single mentor I ever had would say, Josh, you, sometimes you got to slow down to speed up. Right. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to listen before you can speak. And, and so you know, I still work on it every day. And that's why you hear me preach it and, and you teach it. Oftentimes, I'm really just coaching myself out loud through, mm -hmm. through the yeah. voice of uh, helping other people. But uh, that's, that's something that, that, uh, you know, if we talk about superpowers, it's, it's one listening. And, and two, it's, it's being patient enough to know that I will get my turn. You know, people, I don't have this fear that if I don't tell you what I'm thinking first, that you're going to run away from me. I don't have this fear that if I don't do this immediately, everything's going to fall apart. I don't have this mindset of, uh, oh, my God, everything's going to fall down and fall apart. I have the patience to listen. I have the trust that my experience and my skills will provide the pathway and I have the intuition to just remind myself and the self-awareness to remind myself, you know, slow down. If you want to speed up, slow down, listen, and then be understood and make mm -hmm. sure you speak clearly. I love it. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of what I learned too in us working together is that slowing down, listen, you know, make sure that you're understanding that other person's perspective before you move forward and jump in, you know, because I, I think when we get started, um, especially being put in a high performing team, we're so used to just running the hamster wheel that we forget that you have to think about the client's perspective. 
And you have to sit there and listen and don't, don't try to interject your opinion too quickly. Think about where that person is coming from. Take it in before you act and move. And I think that that is so, it's so important. It's the real estate therapy that you and I talk about all the time, well, right? <laughs> well, it's, all, it, it's almost like life therapy, right? Though, yeah. because, you know, it's, it's so funny how, you know, uh, sales has this really negative connotation, right? Mm -hmm. Like people yes. hate to be sold things. People don't want right. to. People don't want to feel like like you're you're manipulating them or you're you're pushing them to do something that they don't want. It has this extremely negative connotation. But um, you know, the art of sales, and when I talk about the art mm -hmm. of sales, I mean more of of understanding the fundamentals and understanding how the mind works. And, and focusing on the skill of being able to sell, it's incredible. I, I, I think that that's one thing. People say, do you love real estate? And I think I love sales more than I love real estate, but not because of income or, you know, be able to accomplish goals or, or being put on pedestals. I love sales because it has life applications everywhere. And, mm -hmm. and not, to, not to be cliche where, you know, you hear these motivating speakers and these, you know, corporate trainers say everything in life is a sale. Um, and what I think, what I, what I internalize that as is, you know, if you're having a conversation with your significant other, if you're having a conversation with your children, if you're having a conversation with somebody at school or a teacher or a professor or whoever, if you're having a conversation, typically there's a desired outcome. Right. And whether that's just you want them to know you cared about them, you want them to know that you really are trying your best, you want them to know that you really want it, whatever it may be, there is a desired outcome. And the ability, the skill set, I mean, and it and it's funny, it, it, it crosses over to dating, right? Like if you're meeting somebody <laughs> new, you want them to you want them to like you and you gotta have the right mindset. Otherwise you're gonna be that person calling them thirteen times, wondering if you said the wrong thing, all those kind of things. Um, I never called anybody it's, 13 times. I cut like, it off. I yeah. cut it off at seven, you know, it's like, they're not, they're not that into you. <laughs> Got to move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're just not that into you. But, but the, the reality is, is that sales is just effect, effective communication. Right. It's just mm -hmm. about understanding what people want and understanding how to provide a solution and being able to articulate a few different options that allow them to make an easy choice. Right. And by mm -hmm. doing so, you know, when, when it's done right, it's this really beautiful thing. And people really love a great salesperson because people love to buy, right? People love to buy stuff. It's a fun <laughs> process. It's exciting. You get to, you know, there's a, there's a positive emotions about it. And at the end of the day, uh, it's a really beautiful thing when done right. And there's so much opportunity because so few do it well. Right. Right. Yeah. And what, a lot of what you're saying too, I was just lecturing on that before you came on. Um, the kind of cliche of sales is everywhere. We're always selling, whether it's to our significant other or to our boss or to our kids, like our friends, we're, we're, we basically have a desired outcome. And we're also talking to another individual who has their own set of needs and wants and desires and dreams and all of those things. And you have to put all of those pieces together to figure out how you can kind of come um, together to the table to create the best desired outcome for everybody in a lot of ways. So um, yeah, that's super fascinating. Um, okay, I'm gonna move to the next question. So uh, this is one of my favorite things was one of my favorite things about working with you was going through just kind of like the market uh, high level snapshot. Like, you know, that I love market analytics. I love to nerd out on like market data. Um, one of the things yeah. that was like super fun about us working together and Brian was very much, Brian Kane was super much of a market um, analyst. Same with Gary Keller. Um, tell me about the, your market snapshot right now. When people ask you about the market, what story do you tell them? What is the story of right now? It's funny. Uh, and, and I, I always appreciated, uh, you know, this is again, right. Like seeking to understand, uh, anytime anybody ever asked me, you know, what's going on in the market? Um, I always respond with them. That's great question. It's a really important question, but quick question for you. Are you looking to buy? Are you looking to sell? Are you looking to invest? Right. Um, I think that a lot of real estate agents, 
Uh, and I make this joke because people are always asking me, Josh, what's going on with the market? And they're asking with a specific desire to find out the information to help them be confident about the choice that they think they're people. When people ask questions, they're already kind of leaning a certain way, right? Like they're already kind of have something in their mind. And, and it's like, you know, what's going on with the market? Well, it's a great question, but, but for you, are you looking to buy? Are you looking to sell? Are you looking to invest? And, uh, and I always, I always preface this because, you know, it's like if you ask a hundred real estate agents, is it a great time to buy? Ninety-nine percent are like, "Yep, absolutely, best time right? to buy. Never been better." <laughs> right? And 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 so by using that, you know, for people that want to get into real estate or they want to uh, be listened to and be heard and feel like that advisor, again, you've got to slow down because before I start going on and saying, you know, yeah, I think you should buy right now, I've got to give people a lot of context. Because I know that that they know that I get paid when they buy or sell or invest in real estate. And right. so it's really important to me to let them know that I actually don't care whether or not you buy now or in three years or in five years or 10 years from a personal preference standpoint. I want you to get the best results. I want you to make the best decisions, but I'm going to be in real estate. And all I want to be is your trusted resource. And so, mm -hmm. you know, first and foremost, I say, okay, great. Are we talking about buying? Or are we talking about selling? And if they're going into selling, I'm talking to them about a few different things. You know, uh, right now is hands down without question, the best time ever in the history of real estate to sell a home. But that doesn't mean that you should sell because the reality is, is that uh, and we learned this from one of our mentors, right? Gary Keller, worth a few hundred million. He talked about his 10 reasons on why people don't become wealthy. And one of them was specifically people sell their assets too quickly. So when somebody comes to me and they say, you know, I want to sell or I'm thinking about selling or is it a good time to sell? The answer is there's never been a better time to put a house on the market. There's extremely low inventory. There's extremely low interest rates, which is great for a seller because it means the buyer can afford more home without paying more per month. There's, uh, there's a high demand because people are, are, are shifting all over Southern California, San Francisco, LA, San Diego, everything's being reworked. You know, in, in San Francisco, you still have a phenomenal economy up there and they're, th they're chugging along and they've got some great companies. In L.A., the movie business has never been hotter because of Hulu and Netflix and Disney mm -hmm. Plus and all these producers. Everybody's a movie studio now. So that industry, you know, everybody's busy making money and they all need a house. Right. So the demand is really high. And then San Diego, San Diego has this rebalancing for a long time. We've been a sleepy beach town. You know, a really cool place with essentially cheap real estate, which cracks people up, you know, in Missouri because we're five times the average price. But in Southern California, to get a beach town with an average to temperature of 74 degrees or whatever it is, uh, very little traffic, great culture, like it's just an incredible place and it's been ex extremely affordable. So the real question goes back to the seller, though, or the client that's asking me that in, in the sense of, you know, so what's your long-term goal? So where are you going? Is this a rental property? Is this, are you going to go buy a second home? Do you need to sell this home to get to the next one? What's your retirement plan look like? How does this impact you? You know, some sellers, I want to, you know, some clients, they want to own five or 10 homes. Well, if you keep selling every home you live in and buy, you're never going to get there. Um, so, you know, with sellers, yeah, it's a phenomenal time to sell. And you're probably going to have another six to 12 months of appreciation, meaning whether it's now or in three months or six months, you're probably going to be selling for more. Um, it starts to become a little bit tricky when you get past 2023, because, you know, sooner or later, we've got to slow down sooner or later, we've got to have some things uh, adjust and the market goes up, it goes down, it's never going to go up forever. Uh, but again, it goes back to their, their plans. And the same thing happens with a buyer. If a buyer says to me, you know, Josh, I'm thinking about buying, you know, do you think it's a great time to buy? I use that joke first and foremost. So I acknowledge the elephant in the room. I said, listen, if you ask 9,900 agents, 99 will say, absolutely. It's a phenomenal time. It's the best time. Always buy real estate. But let's go back to the context of what are you thinking about buying? Why are you thinking about buying? Are you going to hold this for a year, two years? Is this, is this a flip? Is this something that you're going to hold for 15 years to pay off your college, you know, your kid's college tuition? Is this going to be something you live in for a couple of years and then you rent it out. What's the plan with the property? Mm -hmm. You know, there's never been a time in, in San Diego, uh, San Diego's history where if you bought a home 10 years later, it was still worth less. 
Okay. And I'll say that again, there's never been a time in history where if you bought a home, even if you bought in 2007 at the absolute peak top, you know, not didn't get any higher, the bubble, you held it 10 years, you were still winning and winning big because not only did the property values come back up, but you've also been paying down your mortgage for years, getting tax benefits, et cetera. So um, if it's a long-term hold and you're and your goal is to create passive income in your retirement and you can comfortably afford it and your job is secure and you're betting on yourself that you're only going to make more money because you're an ambitious or driven or even just a mediocrely a mediocre responsible person you know statistically we make more money as we get into our 30s and our 40s and our 50s and so so yeah you know the same thing is happening where you know, interest rates on the buyer side, they've never been better. You know, even so, we're still below pre-pandemic rates. We're still below, and they were already historically low. They were in the three threes, 3.3. 3, and now we're in the three ones, and still buyers are getting two eights and two nines. You know, just, and I tell buyers, you know, if interest rates go up 1% and property values drop 10%, your monthly payment is still the same. Okay, a lot of people, a lot of buyers are trying to time the market. They're trying to find when is the best time. But it's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market, right? Like the, you always win if you hold it for 15 or 20 years. So right now it's a, uh, it has slowed down in buying, which is great. You know, six months to 12 months ago, we were looking at, uh, well, about six to nine months ago, we were looking at 10, 15. I mean, shoot, Becky, you were competing up against 15, 20 offers at, at one given oh, point, I, which I by just the way, people, against... she got accepted. <laughs> I just competed against one that was 30 offers. Yeah. <laughs> Becky, so let me tell you, let me tell you a quick story about, about your professor real quick. So, so <laughs> Becky calls me up one day and she's like, Hey, I'm going after this competitive offer. And I'm like, awesome. What can I do to help? And she's like, I got it. I was like, you got it. She's like, yeah, there's like 10, 12, 15 offers, but I'm doing breakfast with the <laughs> listing agent tomorrow morning. I was like, you're what? Like you're doing breakfast with like, I've never done breakfast <laughs> with anybody to get an offer accepted. No, I'm not going to breakfast with you. Like I got stuff to do. Take, out of the take my wife to breakfast. <laughs> yeah. And, and no joke. She, she goes and has breakfast with this guy and gets the property for like 20 grand less than every other buyer. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was incredible, but, so but anyway, going back to, going back to, you know, the, it's cooled down. It's absolutely cooled down to where, you know, now we're getting one, two, three offers. And I tell buyers, you know, the best deals are found by being the most prepared and the most motivated because there are sellers that are, are having to sell in the holiday season. They've got a job. They've got something going on where they don't have the luxury of waiting around for the highest and best price. They've got to go with the most qualified buyer. And if you can position yourself like that and get in, there's no data showing that the real estate market's going down in the next six months, especially with the Omicron variant going on. Uh, typically, you know, what we see is as these variants go up or as they come around or as cases go up, inventory stays low because people don't want to move and they don't want to sell. And the media does a fantastic job at pumping out information that will grab people's attention, usually with the emotion of fear behind it. And people will buy into that because health is really, really important. And as they do, it suppresses inventory. It also keeps the government suppressing interest rates. And as long as those two factors are in place and everything else in the business world is still going really well, right? Like it's a K-shaped recovery. There's people that are really struggling. But for the most part, a lot of companies are doing big things that they've never done. They're making more money. People are making a ton of money in the stock market. I mean, I had a friend made eighty thousand dollars in three days on GameStop stock. Oh you know, with the whole Reddit thing, yeah. right? Like, like people are making funny money, and as long as those things are there, we're likely to continue of what's been happening over the last twelve to eighteen months. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So. Um... Oh, so much is going on. Okay, one question related to the market still about, uh, we're obviously in this like hyper sellers market right now, hyper, hyper, hyper speed. 
when do you, can you take out your crystal ball of sorts and see when we might get it? when can the market shift when are we going to start moving into a buyer's market where it's a little more uh uh come on buyers got to get a break when's that going to happen josh you, <laughs> you know you know you know what's funny is like so so sellers will ask me you know josh what's my house worth and and Agents want to be that expert, right? Like I, your house is worth 1.1 for sure. I know this market better than anybody else, but it's like, we're always wrong as real estate agents. You listen <laughs> out for 1.1, it sells for 1.15 or 1 1.2 or, or 985, right? Like very, very, very rarely does an agent call it on the spot. Um, and, and, Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. If I did, I wouldn't be doing real estate. I'd be doing a lot of other things with that knowledge. But um, here's what here's what I'm looking at is is until we see COVID get into this state where it becomes the new normal, right? Like it's not a pandemic; it's an endemic, just like the flu. Until we get into that stage where eh, it's flu season, right? And all the vaccines and the variants and all that stuff's under control. Until we see inventory come back up and, and come back up drastically, until we see things settle down in the business world and the stock world, um, I, I just don't know what would change it, right? Like what would change it? If inventory is not going up, if interest rates aren't going up, if demand isn't going down, if the rental market is going up just as fast to make it just as a, you know, the, the, that barrier of should I rent, should I buy? If rents are going up too, then it continually pushes people to be like, I'm not paying four grand for this two bedroom, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's, there's other factors. You know, most people seem to think that 2023, right? That's when it really starts to get kind of questionable because we just don't know, right? Like mm -hmm. we haven't seen this before. We've never been at this time in history where we've got all this tech, we've got all the stocks, we've got all this stuff going well. We've got a pandemic that, you know, we're, we've just never seen it before. Mm -hmm. But I think that, I think that if you're looking to sell, you're guaranteeing you're selling at a phenomenal time. It's probably going to run up a little bit more, but if, if it fits into your plans and it makes sense and you can turn that sale into something really positive and leverage it, fantastic. And if you're buying and you're going to be there for a long time, just shake it, shake it off, take it on the chin, get in and be excited when you have some equity in a little while. And, you know, have a little bit of the, of the crypto mindset in the sense mm -hmm. of like, if I buy crypto, I don't check it every day because I have a heart attack, right? Like 30% swings here and there. Like you just let it ride and don't worry about the quote unquote equity. Um, you know, a little nugget that my mentor taught me is don't take your, your equity, don't count that in your personal net worth because it's fake, right? Like people ask me all the time, Josh, how much equity do I have in my home? And I say, I don't know when you're selling. Yeah. Cause right mm -hmm. now you just, you just have a, you just have a Zillow. You have a number on a, on a computer website on Zillow or Redfin. that makes you feel good about whatever it is that you're doing. Like, Oh, I've got $200,000 of equity. Can't do anything with it. Cause you have to pay, you know, like, so Get in and, and let it ride and, and sit tight and, and just work the plan. Invest in real estate, not because you think you're going to make 100K in the next year, but because you know that if you hold on to it for 20 years, it, you could literally have it, sell it, pay off your college kid, your kid's college education. You could buy your dream home, your retirement. I mean, set up for the future and you'll be fine. So backing up just a bit, can you share your transaction history for the class? And um, what's your sales been like in, since you started in real estate and today? And then I'm going to move into another segment of my part two of the question. All right. So uh, the first eight years of my real estate career were, was helping people, you know, set up their websites, their marketing. Uh, I, I was licensed for a little bit in South Carolina, uh, three months. I sold one home in South Carolina. And then I moved my whole business over to San Diego. My first year, uh, I had started a, a real estate team. I felt really confident in what I knew um, in regards to the business development side. We did 33 transactions the first year. It was me, a business partner, and uh, one uh, agent that did about six homes. And then we had another support staff member that also did about six homes. 
Um, but we did a total of 33. Year two was around the same. We hit some really big uh, business development challenges. We, we almost went broke, actually, because we were investing so much. You know, most real estate agents sell about six homes a year, not their first year, but six homes a year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in, in San Diego, that probably equates to sixty, seventy thousand dollars in income uh, with your broker splits and your fees that you got to pay. Uh, year one, we had business expenses of about seventy two thousand mm -hmm. dollars in our first year. And we had two partners. So we had to create two. I mean, we literally were investing six to $7,000 a month in the business because we were absolutely convinced that nothing could go wrong, but we were making a lot of fundamental mistakes. And so year two was about 30, 33 transactions. Um, and we were really excited just to do that because we knew, I mean, we had two agents quit. We overhired, we did all, we did everything you could do wrong. We did it. Um, Year three, I partnered up with Brian. I did 33 again. That was like the number. Year four <laughs> yeah. was was year four was 49 um, with a few different referrals and a couple of deals we worked together. So it was a little bit more than 50. Um, and then this year, uh, this year was a different year also because of some transition. So um, you know, I was on pace to do 50, uh, and I also had transitioned away from Kane. I started launching uh, a couple of different businesses and I also needed a little bit of a break uh, for 12 years. I just next level grinding, right. next goal, mm -hmm. next goal, next goal, next goal. And, and even though I sold 20, uh, four, uh, over 50 homes in, in 2020, um, it really took a toll on me personally because I still was doing everything I can to carve out family night with the kids and, and making sure I made every single, you know, dinner, you know, 95% of the, the family meals, I make sure I'm home, even if I got to work till 11 afterwards. And, you know, real estate's great because you can work at home. But so it, it wasn't like I was just ignoring my family or I wasn't showing up to the kids stuff or I wasn't taking vacations. I was just packing everything else around it. And it really had burned me out. And so this year I'll do probably close to, uh, I think 36. I've got mm -hmm. four that are supposed to close this month and I'll do 36. But the fantastic thing is that the volume, I've also been focusing on that higher end business. Yes. The volume is going to be higher. So this is perfect segue into my second, second part of the question is, um, so in the first part of your career, you were selling um, I don't even know what the name is for it. Just average real estate. It's not luxury. I what hate is the that, name right? for it? I hate like, that. Like, <laughs> like, oh, we're selling normal real estate or average real estate or like, low end. What like, do you even like, like, it's not even low end. Is, is there a word that luxury uses for the other, the rest of us? <sighs> like <laughs> I just it, I just call it real estate and luxury real estate. There's okay. real estate and there's luxury real estate. Okay. So so tell there me there is no <laughs> average real estate. Real estate is phenomenal, whether it's a three hundred thousand dollar <laughs> condo, a forty thousand dollar lot of land. Real estate is phenomenal, but it's real estate and luxury real, real estate. estate. But I, I went through that too, luxury. like the average. What do you call it? The average. I'm like, I'm like, I will kick myself in the face if I tell a client, like, oh yeah, I still do average real estate too, right? Like, no, that would not fly. That would not be okay, good. Okay, okay, good. All right, cool, cool. So. Tell me, tell, tell us, like, how does the luxury real estate market, how does it differ from just working in real estate period? What is, what, how yeah, does that shift so for you? It's not as, I think, I think oftentimes I have uh, in the past made things bigger than they were in the transition, right? Like, yeah. like it's still real, it's still real estate, right? Like right. the process is still, still the same. You still call the client. You set an appointment to meet up with them. You meet them. You educate them. You you look to be able to provide them a solution in, in exchange for for being hired. You still market the property. You still review the offers. You still deal with seller and buyer emotions. Um, there's there there are differences though. There are differences because it's you know I, I think the easiest way to give the analogy is that the stakes are higher. The commissions are higher. The expectations from the clients are higher, right? Like, you know, you have normal, uh, and here we go again in this, you have your everyday, hardworking, successful person, and then you have these ultra successful people. And these ultra successful people remind you that there's levels to this game of business and success. Like if you ever watch the show Shark Tank, you know, they're, uh, Robert, 
was on there and he was talking about how when he first met Mark, you know, he was very excited to compete and Mark Cuban was on a whole nother level. And there were things to learn because there's, there's people in this world that are, when, when they say, uh, you know, people like to say, you got to be obsessed to be successful. Mm-hmm. Well, first off, that's all, that's all relative, right? Like whatever your definition of obsessed is or your definition of, of success is, but the reality is there's these ultra successful people that hold themselves to this very, very high standard. And in turn, they want to work with people that also hold themselves to an extremely high standard. And they don't believe that they should have to micromanage you or check up on you. You're supposed to be the person that's 10 steps ahead of everybody. You're supposed to be the person that gives them this Ritz Carlton like experience. Because if you go to a hotel, and you pay 300 bucks and it's a good time. You're like, it was a good time. But if you go to a hotel and it's a thousand dollars a night, the expectation of how long you should have to wait for a drink or what room service right. should be right. like, or what the sheets should be like, or the cleanliness, those mm-hmm. elements, you're like, it's a thousand bucks. Right. Mm-hmm. And the same, the same thing happens when you're selling a 10, $20 million home, $5 million home. It's not like, it's not like you're you're getting a ten thousand dollar check, you know. You're getting paid, and and the interesting thing about about luxury real estate, you would think because the commissions are so much higher that they would try to negotiate with you higher on your commission. It's actually the opposite. Hmm. It's easier to get your full commission because, uh, you know, I'll give an example. There's times where I I partner up with people, and I have I have some of my or other partners are like, you should negotiate with them on price. And I don't want to negotiate with them on price because I want that partner to feel valued. Right. I want them mm-hmm. to be committed to the project. I want them to be fired up when they work with me. And I never want a few dollars to get in the way. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, so one of the great things is because these ultra successful people have these habits and they have their processes and they believe in themselves and what their value is. And they're expecting you to be the same way. They're okay with the money, but they want you to deliver the result. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is the level of accountability is way higher, right? There is no finger pointing. Uh, Gary V says something fantastic the other day. The world loves pointing fingers, but the world hates thumbs. Mm -hmm. right? Thumbs, thumbs are accountability. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the biggest things is, you know, hey, there are no excuses to why that didn't get done. You're in charge, you're responsible, you're the expert, you're the one who's getting paid, you need to deliver. And if anything goes wrong, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. So that stuff is that stuff is easy for me. um, From a from a, a, a processing standpoint, because you know, I learned at a, at a young age that I was in control of my be- behavior. I was in control of my actions. I was in control of my mindset. And it's, you know, I didn't want to be the victim. And so that part was easy. The The challenge is how do you ele- how do you become the best you every single day? Because um, that is tiring, right? Never being satisfied with you know, what you're doing, never being satisfied with how you're performing, uh, looking for new ways to constantly get better. It's an ongoing, never ending process. Um, But, you know, outside of that stuff, you know, outside of the extreme, oh, and the competition's better. The competition's better because there's a ton of people in this world motivated by money and prestige and status and materialistic items. And this is a key to that world. And so you've got people that the only thing they care about is being a, you know, being the best luxury agent on the planet or, or, you know, letting their ego get stroked about how much they've done. And they literally are waking and sleeping and eating successful real estate. So the level of the competition, because if you're, if you're mediocre in this world, you, you, you don't last long. And so the competition, it's like, College and professional. Everybody's a rock star that, real yeah. estate. Yeah, you're like, it's like yeah. college basketball and professional basketball. 
Yeah, every everybody's an all star. You know, like like right now, you'll see. You know, there's twenty one thousand real estate agents in in San Diego alone. Twenty one thousand, and another few thousand are coming in right now in school, and they're all coming in because real estate's great. And every real estate agent, including the ones that are brand brand new that have sold four homes, they're posting on Facebook. You know, hey guys. I just sold this home in four days. I got 35 offers. If you need the best agent on the planet, give me a call, right? Like, I love your and, SoCal bro accent right now. <laughs> bro, uh, that's the SoCal born and raised in right? me. But, but, the rea- but everybody's a star there, right? But once you get into the luxury world, the properties don't move as fast. The properties mm. don't have as much demand. The properties deal with much savvier clients. And so the mistakes are the the mistakes are are magnified right like you can get away with being a horrible listing agent right now and not have a clue of what you do and people still buy the damn property because it's the only one around but when it comes to uh the luxury world uh that's one of the differences too yeah yeah so i'm competition's higher accountability high level of customer experience um the competition is really cutthroat. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so what, what is the most important lesson you learned about yourself while working in real estate? Uh, I think the most important lesson that I've learned that's applicable to so many areas is, um, you know, people come into real estate and think I'm going to show some houses, I'm going to help people buy a home, and I'm going to be successful, I'm going to make money, it's going to be fantastic. And that can be true, right? One of, one of the other things they think about is, you know, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be free, I can do whatever I want, you know, anything I want to schedule, I can. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, but, you know, so the scheduling, right? And, and we, we picked this up from Brian. This is one of the things that Brian taught us that Gary taught him is, is it's not about selling real estate, it's about following a schedule. And, and that goes for anything. And, and that's probably the most important thing that I've learned because, you know, and I was, hold on a second. I was looking for my, my calendar here, you know, uh, and you guys will probably crack up, right? Like I have a paper calendar, right? And there's this story of Gary <laughs> Keller when he was talking about, he was talking about a paper calendar, one of his, men, one of his uh, people that he was mentoring. And I mean, the guy he was mentoring was successful. He probably makes a couple million dollars a year. And he's like, nah, 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 I do, I do electronic calendars. And he's like, cool. He's like, I use paper calendar and I'm, I'm the mentor. And he goes, let's play a game. Let's, let's write down how much we're worth. Let's fold the piece of paper and slide it across the table. And whoever's worth more, we're going to use their scheduling system. And, and it's a joke because Gary's worth a couple hundred that million. And, um, but everything is scheduled out, right? So like on Saturday and Sunday, you know, I'm thinking about what do I have coming up and like my schedule is mm-hmm. all dialed in yep. and everything is there. And I've got my spaces where I need all my priorities are here. Yeah. Um, you know, when you look at, I've got two whiteboards in my office. One is a five foot by three and it's got transactions yep. and, and marketing <laughs> plans. And I've got a second one that's already got 2022 20, goals. Right. Yep. And so um, the, the most important thing that I've learned is doesn't matter whether you're going to school, doesn't matter whether you're trying to start a company, doesn't matter whether you're trying to be a great husband, father, wife, daughter, mother, whatever it is, you have a list of goals, you have a list of actions that need to be accomplished in order to do that. And your ability to schedule the actions and the time, and then consistently work that is going to take you where you want to go. And discipline, I heard something the other day that I thought was incredible because I think, I think I struggle with discipline sometimes because uh, especially as Americans, we're, we're very much, I don't feel like doing that. I don't feel, like, it's just kind of our culture, like do what makes you happy is do what you feel the best on. And, and the, the stuff that makes you successful isn't exactly exciting, you know? So every day I'm supposed to cold call for two hours. And I say cold call, I just mean, I'm supposed to get on the phone and call people and talk about doing business for two hours a day. And 95% of those calls do not lead to any immediate success. And in order to be great on those calls, I've got to wake up early. I've got to get to the gym. I got to leave the house at 540. I hate 
with a passion waking up before eight o'clock. Like I just, I, I like to sleep in, right? Like I like to wake up when my eyes open, um, <laughs> not from some, some, some alarm. And, and so, uh, but by scheduling this stuff in and, and doing the discipline, the quote that I heard that I love was discipline is the greatest form of self love you can have. Mm-hmm. Discipline is the greatest form of self-love you can have because discipline is where your your actions become your dreams right because you know there's there's all these so the, the biggest lesson really is scheduling out your time is mastering your time and how you're spending it and being accountable in it really really matters and and people have this misconception uh, i was working with my uh, social media consultant the other day um, and we were talking about stuff and she said, well, I know as an agent, you know, you, you don't always have, you know, you, you're not always in one different place or your schedule's all over the board. And, and I, I, and that's the, that's everybody's perception with agents. Oh, you just, you're always doing something different. You got actually six, six out of 10 of the activities that get scheduled at the, at the beginning of the week. Well, that's probably an understatement. 15 of the 20 activities that scheduled at the beginning of the week. They're all the same activities and they're all at the exact same time. And then all of the other stuff gets filled into those areas. So um, the, the ability to schedule your time and plan your life is a, a tedious uh, task. And it's the thing that will unlock whatever you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. It's the, and because people say it all the time, right? And, and I always laugh when I hear this. They go, oh, I don't got time for that. Yeah, you do. You, you busy at 3 a.m. on Tuesdays? Right. You got that time blocked already, right? Like, like there's time for almost everything if it's a priority. And, and it's cool. You know, I'm not, I'm not one of those hardcore people where, like, like, I play video games sometimes. And I'll play for an hour and a half, two hours because that's how I, I recharge, right? Like, I'm an 80s baby, and I loved video games when I was a kid. And there's times I, I, I nerded up. I yeah. played War, World of Warcraft. I don't care. Like, whatever, whatever I got to do. And, and there's time for everything, but schedule it out, mm-hmm. write down your priorities and, and move it forward. And if you just show up every day and do your best, uh, you don't have to be perfect. I don't like, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to say you, but I don't have to be perfect. I just have to be consistently working to get there. Mm-hmm. And I just can never be in that state where I say, ah, I give up. I don't want to do this. I'm changing gears. Hey, sometimes I get my ass kicked and I, I go, you know what? I'm done for today. I, I, I'm done. Nothing good's coming. I'm, I'm trying to force it. It's not fitting. Mm-hmm. I'm going to refresh. I'm going to wake up in the morning. I'm going to get a workout, have a protein shake, and uh, see where I go from here. It's not about perfection. It's progress. That is important. Um, yeah, no, amazing. Okay, so last, last question. Um, these students, when they started uh, this class, had said emphatically, not interested in real estate, just to, took this class because it was the last option, which is totally fine. But I am hoping that through the last 10 weeks that there is a little seed in the back of their head. Maybe they're interested in uh, joining the industry one of these days. What is your advice for somebody who is interested in getting into real estate? You know, uh, real quick. So if you're going to get stuck in a class because it was the last option available for your, 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 your class loadout, at least you land on, 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 on Becky, right? Like, like you can land on, a, yeah, you can land on like a class you don't want and a teacher you don't want. That was like me at, at economics. I'm like, this guy's the worst. Sh- oh, shout out thanks. to my teacher. Um, and, and, and second, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to real estate, um, there's a lot of really great things, uh, that can be, can be, uh, discovered about yourself. There's a lot of great things. Like it'll push you and it'll challenge you. And you literally have the ability to create whatever it is that you want because uh the price points are so high right like uh so when i was selling websites funny enough this is this is when i really decided that i'm wasting my time here 
is I finally, I'd been to three or four companies and in my trajectory in the corporate world was like this. Like I could go wherever I wanted. I could get hired without getting an interview. Mm-hmm. I'd built up a reputation. Like I, I was there. There was nothing anybody could say that I couldn't, couldn't answer. There was nobody I couldn't outproduce, blah, 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 blah. And um, what I learned was, is that the commissions for website sales, when it all broke down, because I finally got back into the business development side and understanding compensation plans and how they work, it was 3%. It was 3%. And I, a light bulb clicked off. Real estate's 3%, two and a half in California, but it's 3%. So if you're going to be in sales or if you're going to be in a business and the, the time to sell is very, very similar, right? It takes me just as long to call a seller, have a conversation with them, meet them at their house, get a contract signed as it did to sell a website that was 150 or 1000 or $12,000. The time to do it was the exact same. So wait a minute, if the, if the time is the same, the commission is the same, then the answer to this puzzle is bigger price points. Mm-hmm. Um, real estate is something that is also going to challenge you in, in a ton of different ways. And uh, it's something that real estate should be a part of everybody's life, whether you're selling it, whether you're living in it and you're owning it, or you're using it as a vehicle for, for wealth building and uh, having people around you that understand it is not a bad thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's still an incredibly valid, valuable skill set and knowledge and education to have. And um, I would just encourage people to uh, be familiar with it. Stay, stay in, the, in tune with it. You know, one of my biggest, uh, I, don't, I don't really regret things, right? Like, I, I feel like I was supposed to be there at that time and I learned the lesson. But it, one of the things that I, I look back and go, ah, shoot, I, if I had only known or if I wish I was prepared is, right during the crash. You know, I was selling Mm -hmm. websites. I was 24 years old. I had horrible credit score because I was rebellious and arrogant. I didn't have a high income. Um, But really the biggest thing was I didn't have credit score and I uh, didn't know about the real estate market. The reality is I was living in an apartment that was $1,200 a month to rent. Next door was the same exact condo that was actually better than ours, had better flooring, better kitchen, et cetera was selling at a price of like $128,000 that, by the way, would have been $900 in mortgage. It was still when the tax benefits really, really helped. So it would have been like $600 a month after the tax savings, half of what I was paying. And fast forward to today, that property is worth $500,000. And I could have bought it for 3.5% down, aka nine grand, including closing costs. That's incredible. <laughs> I can't even like it, imagine it, buying it, a property for that much right now. <laughs> oh my God. If I was, if I was in that space with my right. money now, right. I'd be retired right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, and, and that's okay. But uh, it, it came because one, I didn't understand how banks give money out. I didn't understand the types of products that were available. I didn't understand the market and I didn't understand how to uh, build cash flow. Mm-hmm. And those were four things that, that as much as you guys are going to school and getting your degree, the reality is there's not a ton of college courses or focus on that. They're mm-hmm. going to teach you guys about skills and about classes and about education that you need for your profession. But it's not like unless you're going into finance, it's not like people are teaching you how does compounding interest work? How does time in the markets work? How does credit scores work? How do people buy apartment buildings without using some, without using their own money, right? Like it's not like you guys learn these things unless you're specifically going into that field. So whether you want to be a real estate agent or not, who cares? Really, who cares? But – you're going you're gonna to need a place to sleep in, in the next 40, 50, 60, 70 years. You don't, you're, either pay, you're, you're always paying a mortgage. The question is, are you paying yours? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Or someone else. So there's a lot of value. Yeah. But, well, that's, that's oh, so many good things. I have so many follow-ups, but we're coming close on our time. Um, I am going to open it up. If, if anybody has a question that they want to ask Josh right now is definitely the time. So, um, 
I will ask Wu Zhang only because you're the only person that's on, cam <laughs> on camera. If you wouldn't mind, um, maybe I'm muting yourself. I'm gonna put you on the spot okay. to ask a question to Josh, if you don't mind, or make a comment, either one. Yeah, actually, um, since I'm, I'm not major in real estate or I'm not working in real estate um, industry, I think I don't have like questions regarding it, but um, I've been like confusing about myself. Am I like, doing it right at work, at school and everything? And after um, listening to his like lessons or, you know, wisdom about those um, listening to other people, like slowing down and um, do your best and wait for your turn. Um, I was like, um, it was really like helping me a lot. I could have like, confidence. Oh, I was doing it right. I don't have to be like confused. And I'm also um, the paper calendar holy. <laughs> Oh, nice. <laughs> Paper yeah, calendar, I'm, cool. I actually have it with, with me right now. And um, I, I knew that, I realized that um, on my calendar, my goal was missing. I only had mm -hmm. things to do. Mm -hmm. And then after listening to um, his lecture, I even um, put my sticky note, set a goal here. <laughs> awesome. So everything, yeah, everything, um, it was really um, great to hear his thoughts I could apply to um, my everyday everyday life. And I agree that um, I had that um, being familiar to real estate goal when I first took your class. And I think I succeeded in that way. That's awesome. I even got interesting, um, I mean, interest on real estate um, field. Um, also, well, I didn't even know where to start to learn about the field because I'll be the seller or the buyer in the future. So thank you for that to you and to Joshua as oh well. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. I appreciate your words. You're, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> hey, one thing, one thing that uh, I'll share this with you because um, I have been really ambitious for a really long time mm -hmm. and I was I've also been extremely impatient. I'm like that, uh, I'm like Veruca and uh, Willy Wonka, like I want it right now. And, and, and the society that we have is all about instant gratification, mm -hmm. right? It's all about making an impact and I wanna do it right now. And because of the way social media is and because of the way the media is now, there's a million people that we can list out that are doing bigger things than us. And it can really make us feel bad and we can create stories in ourselves. And, you know, it's funny because my son, my son one day, so we was watching Netflix and you know how it buffers, like if the internet's not loading up, right? He was like, dad, what's taking so long? And I was like, bro, you don't know about blockbuster video, right? Like right. we had to drive <laughs> down to get a movie and then rewind it, right? But it's all about this instant gratification. Here's what I'll share with you. The first 10 years of my real estate career, I never was happy because it wasn't happening fast enough. Even when I was selling 33 homes, I was almost broke, right? Like, and the whole time, and I, I just kept believing in that hockey stick curve. They talk about success where you just go, 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 and then it just shoots up, right? It's real, and it's real with you guys as well in whatever it is that you're doing. The world has a way of just, you just don't feel like you're making an impact. You don't feel like you're doing as well as you should. And other people around you are, are putting pressure on you because, you know, well, did you hear about Susie's father? He just, da, 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 da. he just sold a dot com company. You know, like there's, there's all this pressure. And I just, and I would say to myself, like, when is my hockey stick curve coming? When is it coming? Like it's been 10 years now. Like I, and so many times I wanted to give up and my wife would look at me and she would go, she goes like, well, then if you hate it, change it. And I'm like, okay, thanks for using my own words on me, right? But like, <laughs> and I'm like, there's there's nothing else to do though. I what am I gonna go do that I'm gonna love that I'm gonna be skilled in? I have to keep going on this path. I either have to go bankrupt and completely fail and just die on the sword, or I've got to get here. And and it comes in the most crazy forms when you least expect it, like a pandemic. And it just went, whew. and, and in the middle of all that, um, it changed all of my perspective. Right. And so I, I just share that with you because 
Uh, I can hear it underneath a little bit of there's that pressure, right? And there's that I've got to do something big. And the biggest piece of advice that is coming out of a lot of different mentors now, and it's something that I, I want to share with people is like, find out what you're doing, where you're going, and just work on that path. And don't worry about the results coming today. Put yourself around people that you trust that can give you good pieces of advice. And, and there, I have people around me that are like, hey, you're being dumb right now. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. And just, <laughs> and, and then just, and then just work. And when you're really tired and you're exhausted, schedule some fun time for you. Give yourself that grace. Go do something for you without fear of like, well, if I do this, I'm never going to make it. Well, I, I can't do that. I don't have time. It won't work. And then just, and then go for it. And, and just, it'll come. The, the yeah. hockey stick curve will come if you want it to. Thank you so much, Josh, for Thank being you here. So much. <laughs> We really appreciate you chatting with us, taking this hour and um, just giving us, gosh, all of this knowledge, so many nuggets to take away. I'm going to have to rewatch this video and pull it together. And, and by the way, the students are going to write, write a reaction paper on your presentation. So I'm excited to share those with you too. <laughs> I, I just got nervous. They're like, they're like, eh, it was all right. It was all right. <laughs> well, thank you so much again. All right. Thanks, and guys. Look forward to Be seeing well. you soon. Thank you.